Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman Family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 218, a book that didn't make it. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And we are here for an episode discussing a book that comes from the Apocrypha. We'll get into a little bit more what that is in our conversation today, but we are anchoring today's conversation on the Book of Jubilees, which is a book that didn't make it into the Bible, and, or at least not into the traditional Bible that Jews uh, have considered the traditional Bible for most of the time of rabbinic Judaism. But it's a book that, that for various reasons is particularly relevant to the upcoming holiday of Shavuot. And so before this whole coronavirus situation occurred, Lex and I had an idea that we would explore the Book of Jubilees over the course of the seven weeks leading to Shavuot, which is called the Omer, and that we would use it in some way to anchor some of our thoughts and some of our questions. Well, as we all know, the world has changed and we don't know what we're going to do tomorrow, much less over the next seven weeks, but we did already schedule a conversation with a previous guest on Judaism Unbound, Barbara Tita, or Shulamit Tita, as she's known in the Jewish renewal world. And so we wanted to have a conversation with her to anchor our thinking about the Book of Jubilees in a little bit of scholarship before we just go off half-cocked into whatever cockamamie theories Lex and I generally have. So before we jump into the conversation, a brief word of introduction about our guest. Barbara Tita is the Dean of Faculty of the Aleph Ordination Program and a member of its academic VOD. She teaches Hebrew Bible, Judaism and Jewish history, the Holocaust, and the history of European anti-Semitism in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. She was ordained in 2011 as a rabbi and in 2012 as a Mashpia Ruchanit, a spiritual advisor, by Aleph. She is currently working on a book for Routledge Press entitled Male Friendship, Homo Sociality, and Women in Hebrew Bible, Malignant Fraternities. Barbara Tita, welcome back to Judaism Unbound. It's great to have you here again. It's a pleasure to be here. So ironically, usually when we have an interview, we start by asking the interviewee, the guest, a question. But actually, I'm going to start today by asking Lex a question, because really, Lex, All this right. is something that came from from you. And I think it would really be a great anchor for you to talk a little bit about why you took an interest in it and what you're hoping to get out of this exploration. This is the dream. We're talking about the Book of Jubilees on Judaism Unbound slash Jewish Live, and that's what I've wanted for a while. Okay, here's why. There's two categories of reasons why I'm into the Book of Jubilees. You know if you have two entire categories of why you're into something, that you're deeply into that thing. So the first category are things specific to this book, the specific book called Jubilees, which is sort of a different take on the book of Genesis. Some people talk about it as like little Genesis. It, it takes the book of Genesis and tells a lot of the stories that are contained there, but there's sometimes subtle and sometimes less subtle changes to those stories. And so there's a few pieces about this book specifically that I think are fascinating. One is it is structured more so than any other Jewish book I know of around the rhythm of time. That matters a lot to me. When people ask me what I think Judaism is like good at or why be Jewish, any of these kinds of questions, I tend to immediately say that Judaism, and you know, Judaism is a complicated word to try and distill into one essence, but here's what I do as an attempt, um, even if it's a tough thing to do. I say Judaism provides a great rhythm. It provides a rhythm to your day, to your weeks, to the flow from month to month, and even from year to year. And we have, and this is, I think, not news to anybody. People, of course, understand Shabbat, which is, you know, a once every seven days cyclical moment where we mark a kind of sacredness. But more than that, when you really dig deep, 
there's cycles to the months of the year that each have their sort of uh, I don't know, emotional valence. Then you even get to the cycle of the seven years, the sabbatical year cycle. And then in the Torah, here's where the word jubilees comes in. Um, there's this idea of a yovel, of a jubilee, every seven cycles of seven years. So that's a long period of time that we have marked rhythmically. Now, this book, Jubilees, literally starts and it says, in the first year of the first week of the first jubilee. Now, what does that mean? It's saying, th when it says a week, it means seven years. It's like a weird thing. They call seven years a week. And they consider that sort of a subsection of a broader jubilee. Jubilee is a unit of time, which means 49 years. Um, and so the entire book, every single event that happens starts with, in the third year of the fourth jubilee, and you have to have a calculator there to like multiply 49 times four or whatever, and then add three times seven to figure out what year we're talking about. Um, but I love that because A, I'm a numbers guy. B, it provides a rhythm to the text itself that I don't think is present in Genesis. Genesis is a great set of stories that flows well, but it doesn't feel necessarily like one contained narrative. So Jubilees does that. I'm going to pause for a second there because my second category of reasons is not so much about Jubilees, but about Jubilees as an example of a text that sort of didn't win in Jewish history. Um, I have a set of reasons I like Jubilees that are not about what it says, but about the fact that it's sort of hidden in Jewish history, but contains gems for us that we could apply to our world. And so for that, I'm going to pass over to our guest, to Barbara Tita, and ask sort of, what are some reasons that you would argue we might care about texts that didn't win? The most important issue here for me is that the texts that we do have in our canon, in the European Jewish canon, have been profoundly influenced in our minds by rabbinic readings, which themselves are influenced by the position of rabbis in European history. So once you unpack these range of characters, this range of literature, it tends to give you open doors into ways of thinking about how Judaism has been constructed, how Jews and Judeans have lived their lives that are not pre-designed, pre-decreed, pre-interpreted by a rabbinic European context, which has a certain set of conditions in the way that it reads Torah and Tanakh and those books. And freeing ourselves from that also permits us to, to decenter rabbinic readings of our past and to include really scintillating and exciting other visions of who we were. The very book of Jubilees, the very fact that this book is preserving hundreds and hundreds of years of a tradition of thinking in time in terms particularly solar in emphasis rather than lunar. Right? That's very, very, very old. And that is also part of our tradition. So I want to put out an analogy that I wonder, I think it's uh, relevant in terms of the Book of Jubilees, that imagine that now, just for simplicity's sake, imagine that today in our world we have three genres of fiction. We have science fiction, romance, and mysteries. And imagine that some cataclysm came along and the only people that survived were the lovers of romance novels. And they basically just threw the, the science fiction and the mysteries into the trash. So, and, and they built a, a new uh, culture that was just built on romance novels. So maybe eventually sci-fi, you know, regenerates again, but it's now built on a romance genre of sci-fi. And like, that's all we have. It's like and built on the structure of the romance novel. That's in a little way what I un understand sort of happened here in the sense that the Bible as we know it, as most of us know it, was the decision of some subcategory of people who lived a couple thousand years ago about which books within a much larger library of literature they preferred. And because of various cataclysms, there was then a founder's effect 
that what became known as Judaism was the the thing that was founded by those people who only liked these books. The issue for some of us is that the way that gets reported to us 2,000 years later is that these are the authentic books. These are the legitimate books. And all that other stuff, uh, we don't know anything about. You know, don't, don't even look over there. And But the reality is that they're sort of equally authentic in the sense that they were all around at this proto-history stage. So first of all, I guess my question is, do I have that basically right? And my second question is, can you tell us about, can you tell us a little bit about the people who preferred the other books? Like who was it that that pref would have preferred the Jubilees book and what would have the world looked like if we had had a future under that founder's effect? In my classes, I frequently speak about the bestseller list. You know, which books were on the bestseller list and when did they fall off? When did we lose the book of Yasher? It's referred to in what we know as our Bible, but we haven't got it. Texts and stories and narratives. This, this, is, this is really a thousand years of pre-common era history in terms of transmission and decision making, even before we get to the rabbis. It's not like this process hasn't been going on earlier, too. Uh, so, you know, for centuries, various uh, Jewish elite um, or Judean elite or ancient Israelite elite are making decisions about which of these texts are going to become you know, the bestseller list. And, and it's so complicated, Dan, that we even have uh, multiple versions of Jeremiah. You just take a look at the difference between what we call in the scholarly world Hebrew Bible and Septuagint, and you've already got multiple versions of, of texts. And I should also say that even what we have received is still itself one of multitudinous, multitudinous versions of Tanakh that were around particularly in the Middle Ages in which people argued about in terms of details and wording and so on and so forth. So. Uh, who are the Judeans who thought the Jubilees text was so important? Largely, you know, the Qumran community, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll collection is heavy into texts like Jubilees, and that's, you know, the, also things like the community rule or the uh, texts in that collection, which are uh, highly oriented, as Lex has indicated, around time and certain kinds of solar structures. That community found this text really, really valuable. And they also rejected some texts. So the Book of Esther is not to be found in the Qumran community. Too much sex and drugs and rock and roll for them. But you will find the Book of Enoch. A lot of that apocryphal thinking and those apocryphal texts, by the way, also make their way into Christian settings, right? because they are partaking of the same soup of ideas, of apocryphal ideas about the world to come, the end of the world, the imminent end of the world, and so on and so forth. The idea that we do have both a kind of loss because in about 600 CE, rabbinic Judaism really becomes the powerful publisher of Jewish texts, um, and Another thing and caveat I want to make about this that's important to know is that the rabbis know these texts. They didn't just ignore them. You can find references in rabbinic tradition to texts from the Book of Enoch, from other external texts. They will refer to these. So it wasn't just a elite, okay, this is in the list and nothing else can be considered. I don't want to diss the rabbis on that level. There are a lot more wide-ranging in what they know and what they consider than we might imagine. I didn't think that I would flash to this particular recent episode, but I'm flashing to a recent episode we had with Eileen Levinson, who is the founder of, of all things, Haggadot.com, which is a, a website that allows people to make their own Passover Haggadahs, um, guidebooks to Passover. And she said something I thought was so cool. She was talking about like the back end of her website, and I promise this will relate. I promise. It's weird, but it will relate. She was saying that and the way that websites work, or at least many of them, and so she's featuring all these different resources that people have submitted. And the ones that people click on initially, they get popped up to the top of the page. They become featured so that other folks are more likely to continue clicking on them. So if something starts out popular, it sort of keeps on steamrolling. And what she said is that this year she's working on finding certain contributions that specifically 
haven't been popular and featuring them on the top of the site so that people are more likely to find those because otherwise it's just going to be these popular ones. And so the analogy I'm making is that's what we've done with texts historically. So picture instead of resources on Hagadot.com, you know, Book of Jubilees versus Book of Esther versus Book of Genesis versus Book of Jeremiah, we sort of continually cycle and teach children to learn these books and not those books. And it just pushes the marginalized ones farther and farther down, and it elevates the centralized ones up and up and up. And all that's a preamble because I want to talk about another group that um, for a long time had a deep relationship to Jubilees. Um, you mentioned earlier that the that the Qumran community had one. Um, Ethiopian Jews, the, the Beta Israel, have a deep relationship to Jubilees. And I name that because it matters that that community, I, I think it matters, that that community in many ways has been marginalized for all sorts of things Jewishly. And people have questioned whether they're Jews at all. And the Israeli government has questioned whether they're Jews at all. And and so when we when we say things like, ah, Jubilees sort of didn't make it in, right? Well, it did make it in. For some Jews, just a small group that we don't talk about very much. And I'm curious to hear from you what that reflects more broadly. Help us understand sort of what happens when we talk about certain Jewish traditions as like being Jewish traditions and others not, even though some small groups might actually still be having a relationship to those rituals. One of the things that I find people are not thinking about who are in powerful positions in modern day American Judaism and modern day European Judaism is the way in which that constituency, European and American Judaism, is a child of European colonialism and has acted very much in the traditions that has learned at the hands and as part of European history. We tend to think of ourselves as the oppressed minority in Europe. And so therefore, we have sympathy and understanding for other oppressed minorities or, you know, these outlier groups. But in fact, our way of approaching groups like Ethiopian Jews um, and groups that maybe only recently claimed Judaism, so, for example, the B'nai of Chaim, right, who are a cast of Madiga untouchables, who, after being exposed to Christianity first, right, missionized by Christians, then discovered that they needed to be Jews and identified as Jews. So, on the one hand, you get this, this how do these people look like us and what is their Judaism and ancillarily and immediately, what have they lost that they should have? that we possess and that we need to bring to them and we need to educate them in and we need to teach them, right? So that seminary after seminary and all sorts of different constituencies are involved in bringing the Judaism that was lost to communities like Ethiopian Jews. And in quotes on that lost. Yeah. Yes, again, in quotes, right? I'm doing a lot of um, finger quotes here. The process is not going to those communities and finding out until maybe only recently, what do they have to teach us about the practice of Judaism? But it has been rather the more likely either full rejection, they can't really be Jews, they practice paternal lineage rather than maternal lineage in their definition of of their children, or they do this or that or the other, so they can't really be like us, or they're enough like us so that we have to be the grand bestowers as sort of a white man's burden in Jewish sense of real Jewish life, real Jewish culture, and the right Jewish texts they should be focusing on. What are we doing in the way of exercising power and authority and class and race as constructs that we are taking to our communication with such communities? Well, it's interesting that you talk about that because we spoke with one Mejia, who's a rabbi who's been teaching Judaism in Spanish for folks in Latin America. It's a long story, some with Jewish origins, some with without. But one of the things that was interesting that he reported to us was that the majority of them, the majority of folks from Latin America who started off 
Catholic, but potentially with Jewish ancestry from the time of the Inquisition, that eventually many of them want to become Orthodox. And I guess, you know, they want to become Orthodox Jews. And, um, and I guess my question is, is that because they're internalizing some kind of sense that that's the right kind of Jew to be? And like, what would you have to do to fully uh, get the message that says, no, 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 we don't want you to become Orthodox, yet. or you can, you can if you want to, but what we really want is for you to reimagine Judaism and with all the traditions of, of your culture and of other cultures and of maybe older books that you're going to reach back and find resonance with a book like Jubilees. Like what, how, how do you see that all working? That is an immensely challenging problem because we come to those constituencies with an idea of what conversion is. And even the most liberal Jews have ideas of what conversion is. And conversion is a process to, again, a largely European model of Judaism. So we're already set up on the ground floor for all sorts of concerning issues. And we generally are not all that transparent about it. I mean, I just look at the way in which seminaries will take um, African Jewish leaders into their fold who frequently operate and learn and teach using largely oral traditions. And they're like put in this place and then asked to operate as if they were Western thinkers in academic settings, which demand devotion to a literary transmission of knowledge, uh, let alone what the actual knowledge package is. What would we say and what could we do for, so you're speaking specifically of those, the kinds of communities where people have started out in that Catholic world and then so easily gravitate towards wanting Orthodox Judaism because it is authentic Judaism. You know, if all if all of Judaism, um, American, right, could um, do a lot on its own to derail its little child stepsister problem regarding Orthodox Judaism, like we have some inner work to do here around the assumption that what happens in Orthodox Judaism is the legit, is the real, is the authentic. And I'm saying all of that in quotes, right? And so when we internalize that ourselves, it's going to be really hard to, to deal with people who have essentially purchased the very same assumptions we have but we haven't actually done the work of exposing the fact that we ourselves are subject to the premises of the very people who are coming to us if we're in liberal Judaism, right? Um, so how do we expect to, to transform the way they're looking at it, right? The vast majority of my own seminary students start out with a kind of uh, implicit guilt that they're not Jewish enough because their measure is a measure of Orthodox Judaism or even conservative Judaism. Until we do that work, there's no hope for how we can respond to people who are coming to us effectively just taking a somewhat more intense uh, version of our own premises and operating on that. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about it is that um, I, this past year, was trying to experiment with a new practice, a new Jewish practice for my family, which was actually drawn based on the movie Coco, that I felt that the idea of a day of the dead was really powerful. And I felt missing it in Judaism. Like I know that we remember the dead in all kinds of wonderful ways, but I love the idea of a day of the dead. And so I was trying to play around with that idea while also trying not to, you know, do bad cultural appropriation, but at the same time trying to do like good borrowing, which I think most of Judaism is good borrowing or from other places. And and so it's like a little frustrating to me that the folks from Latin America want to become like Ashkenazi Orthodox Jews, you know, or maybe Sephardi Orthodox Jews, whereas I want to be like more like a Mexican Jew, you know, so it's kind of like, um, you know, I, I wish that they could team up with me because, you know, I, I have some ideas about how what they're doing is super great and they shouldn't stop doing it to do what, you know, to have some gefilte fish. I love the idea of the good borrowing because the vast majority of what 
um, we do in all sorts of simchas, happy occasions, life cycle events, we consistently assume that what we are doing is coming from rabbinic provenance. And about 90 or more percent of what we do is part and parcel of that creative borrowing, right? The challah is not a Jewish invention. It's a German Catholic, right? The um, business of uh, brides circling the grooms comes from a Catholic medieval tradition. Good borrowing, we've been doing that since, since oh my gosh. Um, I want to pull us way, way back to... 6th century, 5th century, 4th century BCE, when we end up in Alexandria and we end up in various parts of the Greek world picking up all sorts of Greek ideas, traditions. You know, Beit Sherim is filled with Greek mythology um, symbolized in sculpture all over the place. Good borrowing is, to my mind, maybe, Dan, your pathway to that conversation. Like to just speak about how Judaism and Jews have always been engaged in this process of exchange, in remaking, and dare I say, renewing what they think Judaism is, including the rabbis too. So I just like, they're part of that process. Could you tell us a little bit about, as you see it, what kind of a Jew the author of Jubilees was? Like, what was that genre of literature that we've lost? So scholars tend to think of the author of Jubilees, you know, as, as a, a priestly writer on steroids, right? Um, that this looks more to us like the writing of the priestly writer in Tanakh, uh, as opposed to, say, the Book of Enoch, which, which really uh, tends to be more uh, retaining more of the mythological kinds of materials you would find in the J writer or the E writer. Um, because of the incredibly structured way that, Judy, uh, that Jubilees unfolds, I think that's a pretty good assessment, that we have a priestly writer who is, by the way, in his own way, a fanatic too. Right, um, these writers really have an agenda and an idea. You don't follow these particular holidays, you know, you're out, right? Life is over for you as you know it as a Jew. So Jubilees, we shouldn't assume, is the kind of happy place, right, that maybe oh, some of us no, would wish yeah. for. And th there are troublesome passages in every one of these other texts that we have not included as there are in our own. One of the things that I, I have to say has recently become increasingly a trigger, a bother for me, is the way that people keep using the language of these are our sacred texts with sacred myths, right? And I'm also doing the air quotes around sacred myths, right? Um, it's a way of uh, ignoring in some respects the challenges of these texts. If they're all sacred myths, right, then they're all this fount of wisdom for us. They're all this glorious space for us to learn from. But what do we do with the challenges that these texts pose? And we have to apply that same question to books like Jubilees. Where are the rough spots, the difficult spots? The Where do we find problems in the portrayal of women in the uh, text of Susanna or Joseph and Asenath, right? Like all the same questions that are live for us around the canon that we have inherited need to be live for us around these other books too. So I don't want to represent yeah. them as the free right. text that we wish we had. Yeah. And, and I relish that too. I mean, by the way, I, I'm careful when I, when I have longer conversations with folks specifically about Jubilees. I mean, one thing I say is as somebody who's in an interfaith relationship, as somebody who's inter- married um tough book like if this book were centralized and dictated the 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 structure of jewish communities and we had like in many ways i would put it uh, at a similar level as the worst most problematic texts in the existing bible that we accept um i think of ezra and nehemiah as like a comparable example of like really intermarriage is bad um so it's it's definitely not all good but i kind of relish that too right it's like it opens up because for me i'm not approaching these as legal i must accept the dictates of these texts um 
texts that have not been centralized historically were often more open to not ex- to not think of through a legal sense. By the way, um, but when we we have new questions, we have new struggles, and that that opens up new conversations. So that's part of what I want. Um, one specific jubilees note t- that I think um, provides a broader a broader example of of what I think we can gain by exploring these texts that I that I wanted to bring in. Um, the Book of Jubilees connects stories in the Bible to holidays in an explicit way that I find interesting. Like the binding of Isaac in Jubilees is tied to Passover, which like, whoa. Imagine if at your Seder, like genuinely to listeners, like what would change about your Seder? What what new exciting avenues would open up if we, I don't want to say needed, but like if we had to figure out if we had to wrestle with the binding of Isaac at our Passover seders with while talking about liberation, because um, they happen on the same day, that like they, they are so they are associated with each other in the text of Jubilees. What would happen if the journey to Shavuot was connected to Noah's Ark? Noah's Ark in Jubilees is tied to the holiday of Shavuot. Like all of there's all of these sort of anchor points where stories in Genesis are connected to holidays that I think are kind of powerful. And it's almost like we rolled the dice. I I don't want to say it's random. They clearly had reasons for this. But it's almost like we had one die that said holidays and one die that said uh, Genesis stories. And we rolled them and they came up with each other. And we said, ah, Noah's Ark Shavuot. I guess we're going to make those collide and have some meaning-making possibilities there. Like, And for me, it's like, what if we did that for all of... What if we did that for everything? And we were like, what meaning comes up if we think that uh, the story of Jacob and Esau should be marked with this month of the year. I don't know. Um, it just opens up so much, so much creativity, and that's part of what I relish with these texts. It's not only that they're you know specific, different content. It's just you know we have another canvas. Yes. It's actually a reason why years and years ago in my basic Hebrew Bible classes at UNC Charlotte, I used to tell my students that I had wanted to be able to find a funder who could find for me a scribe who would write the book of Jubilees onto a scroll. I wanted 12 of these. And then I wanted to sneak into every major synagogue in major cities across America, replace the scroll altogether with a book of Jubilees, and then see what happens, you know, when the the cantor or the rabbi brings this out, like, oh, well, that looks familiar, but wait, right? Like, how would that completely derail all the drashot, all the experience, the whole sense of what are holy texts or sacred texts, how would that completely unpack a vantage point we've never stood at? And just as you say this, Lex, it is so amazing how how much more expansive Judaism becomes when you find out what the holiday of the Sigd is, right? That is an actual holiday that the Ethiopian Jews model for us in terms of interfaith experience, right? Who attends? A bunch of Christians. What are the Jews doing? They're praying on the part of, on, on behalf of the Christians at that holiday. Like, when have we been doing that kind of thing? That's, you know, that kind of openness has been fairly recent in our country. What happens when we put Jubilees as a scroll all across American synagogues? What what shifts in learning and questioning in unpacking makes us realize that what we are heir to is infinitely richer and infinitely more diverse than we ever imagined. Wow. So I, as always, just love the energy that you bring to these conversations. And um, I just, I, I want to take on that effort. I, like that, that is such a sneaky but amazing thought that we would sub out all the scrolls and synagogues. I mean, it's, it's the right level of subversive for me. Maybe, maybe like we can't do it quite to that extent that you describe with the, uh, describe with the scribe and all of the, the levels. But theoretically, there's no reason we couldn't, like if you're a rabbi listening or if you're not a rabbi, but you lead a Torah study, what would happen if, the weekly Parsha, the weekly story of the week came around in Genesis. So we've got a number of months till this rolls around, by the way. You can plan it. Like we get to, let's say the Binding of Isaac since it came up before. What would happen if you 
took the Binding of Isaac story from Jubilees. I, I can email me. I'll point you to where it is chapter wise. Um, and you subbed that in. That would be fascinating. I will tell you the Binding of Isaac in Jubilees is super similar. So it, it is actually very parallel and there are a lot of even the same language. Um, but it starts out by saying that there is somebody named Mastema who appears to be a demon figure or a Satan figure who actually sort of ordains this process. It's not, it, it's not quite God who initiates, but it's sort of the evil side of God, which kind of theologically, it, it, it softens it a little. Like, oh, God isn't the one quite testing Abraham. God is doing it because this evil force wants God to. And let's um, remember that Mustema but, shows up too in Exodus, right? That's the the personage who's going after Moses. It's not God, it's Mustema. Oh, that's, that's fun. I didn't, I didn't fully realize that. But like, if you subbed that in in the Torah, like, or, or maybe you don't sub it in, maybe you at least have both sources there. So you can look at both. I think all of a sudden, just a whole universe opens up. I've looked at the Binding of Isaac story just about every year that I can remember um, on Rosh Hashanah when it when it's, you know, there's lots of people in the room and you look at that particular story. Um, I never, it had never occurred to me to think about it from the angle of some force besides God kind of initiating that test of Abraham. So, And there's anyway, a, even a third yeah. option you can add in the fact that those stories, the Binding of Isaac is actually uh, likely the product of two different authors. And if you oh. take the second redacting author out, who is responsible for all of the angelic interventions, you'll find actually that the story is a story about disobedience, not obedience. Great. Um, so just that's another fun note. But my, my closing question is, do you have any other you know, creative calls to action for folks on this front. What would it look like for people not only to hear you and be like, wow, she's right. There, there's a way that these texts, these these cultures can expand our approach to Judaism. But like, what what could people practically do to start to envision or create forms of Judaism that incorporate some of these other texts or stories or rituals or cultures? I think the first step has to be and thinking about our own language. So the first thing is a reflection, an act of reflection. When we use the words like assimilate or assimilated or interfaith or all of those things, what are we saying and what are we defining? So there's a first step where we have to figure out what is our language around Judaism? How do we speak about Judaism? Then in terms of a call, I would love it if every single shul decided to do a kind of exploratory project to find either texts or communities or traditions that nobody's ever heard of. And that's not actually all that hard to look up different kinds of Jewish communities and different kinds of Jewish practices and then see where could you actually incorporate them? The Kaifeng Jews never read Torah with their shoes on. What if we thought about always making sure that everybody who reads from Torah takes off their shoes and in addition, they put a veil over their faces, right? Recalling Moses. When they read from Torah, they wore a veil because the blinding light of the learning and the channeling that they were doing was so critical, both the humility and the sense of that power. What happens if we actually teach this to our bar and bat mitzvah students and some of them take us up on that, go barefoot for their Torah reading and put a veil over their face, right? So actually trying to do creative borrowing from our own people from our own varieties, from our own textual traditions, that kind of creative borrowing actually isn't even borrowing it. All belongs to us. Thank you so much, Barbara Tita, for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. And thanks so much to all of you out there listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and we hope that you'll tune in again in the future to our episodes of Judaism Unbound, um, especially ones like this that are Judaism Unbound Live, where we are initially releasing them via video live stream. Uh, you can check those out at jewishlive.org, and you can also continue to check them out via audio in our podcast app, wherever you find podcasts. So thanks for listening. If you're really digging this conversation about 
Um, well, it's not quite biblical history because Jubilees didn't make the Bible, but the history of the Bible, what made it in, what didn't. Um, we're featuring a new show with one of the preeminent scholars of biblical history, Richard Elliott Friedman, whose uh, well-known book, Who Wrote the Bible, kind of blew the roof off the whole conversation of, you know, as the title suggests, who wrote the Bible. He was one of the first folks to really bring to the public the point that the the Bible was authored by a wide variety of sources that came together um, at various historical eras and that turned into the five books of Moses that we now have. That's that's the Torah. Um, and so he's going to be leading a weekly show that we hope that you'll tune into. It's going to be called Richard Elliott Friedman, Return to Torah. Check it out at jewishlive.org. There's information on our Facebook page about it as well. And the other plug we want to make is for our jewishlive.org slash originals page. This is where all of our recurring programming that we have, we've got all these amazing new weekly shows, some are classes, some are musical, there's all sorts of different kinds. They are, the the past episodes are being housed on this page, jewishlive.org slash originals. And that's where you can find all of the past episodes of our shows. You can catch up, get up to speed, and then watch our live episodes as they are released on a weekly basis, different time slots for different shows. So we wanted to give those two plugs and then we want to close out in the same way that we always do by encouraging you to be in touch with us. And there are a wide variety of ways for you to do that. First, there are our two Facebook pages, Judaism Unbound and Jewish Live. Second, there are our websites, jewishlive.org and judaismunbound.com. Third, we've got our Judaism Unbound Twitter handle, which is just at Judaism Unbound. And last but not least, we have our email addresses, dan at judaismunbound.com and lex at judaismunbound.com. The last request we like to make is that we deeply appreciate any amount of donation that you can send our way. And you can do that at jewishlive.org slash donate or judaismunbound.com slash donate. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.